Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we complete a three day program listening to Black women voices about the scourge of colonization and oppression, and also how uh, they have navigated in an inspiring and empowering way uh, to really shape themselves and the larger world in, in a more abundant, healthy, and equitable way. Before we launch our program, I want to provide an update, uh, as I have been doing uh, for the last year on the war in Ukraine. As you all know, the war there is pitting one superpower against another with an escalating probability of a nuclear exchange. Uh, the war has put the world in its most dangerous place in our lifetime, uh, certainly since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. And something has emerged over the last several days that I think is of utmost importance. It was a blog by Seymour Hirsch, uh, who is an investigative journalist who uh, came to prominence uh, in the Vietnam War uh, by writing the story that exposed the My Lai massacre, if you remember that, where U.S. Uh, troops killed uh, over 400 uh, innocent women and children and older men uh, in an episode that was uh, written about by Seymour Hirsch. And ever since then, time and again, and winning Pulitzer Prizes, he's brought to our attention something that's hidden, but when exposed, has a dramatic effect. And he's just written about the Nord Stream pipeline sabotage on September 26th, uh, 2022. You may remember that. It was briefly in the news and then it disappeared. Uh, but it was uh, the sabotage by the United States, by the CIA and the Navy SEALs, that blew up uh, two of the uh, three pipelines that were transporting gas and oil from Russia to Germany and Europe. And we need to just take in just very, very briefly, I'm going to be doing another teach-in uh, probably over the weekend on this. I've been doing a series of teachings on Ukraine just to keep this alive in public, in the public uh, awareness. Uh, but just I want to draw out two points about what happened. Number one, this uh, may be the largest peacetime industrial sabotage in history, where the United States came in covertly and blew up a commercial pipeline complex, one of the owners of which is Germany, one of our allies. And initially, of course, blamed it on the Russians. And that's what was carried in the news, that it had been sabotaged, and it was probably the Russians. It turned out to be the Americans. The second point that I want to make, which I is in some ways more important, is that this revelation has not been carried at all on the mainstream media, not the New York Times, not the Washington Post, not CNN, not MSNBC, not even Fox News, which is often critical of the Biden administration. But you have President Biden ordering sabotage of a friendly country to prevent them from taking oil from Russia. Uh, because the United States is determined that that's not going to happen as it consolidates control over all of Europe, West and East, and foments war uh, in the Ukraine by pushing American NATO military power 
into Ukraine in an attempt to cut Russia off from Crimea and uh, deprive the Ukrainians uh, of the right to be neutral, uh, which they were uh, before the latest incursions uh, by NATO. And so what we have to take in uh, very deeply, particularly those of us uh, who are Americans, is that the culprit in the Ukraine war is the United States, as it has relentlessly pushed NATO to the east since 1990. And now the Russians, uh, in really taking a last stand, uh, have seized uh, the land bridge that secures their access to Crimea uh, and the Black Sea. Uh, and they're supported by uh, most of the rest of the world, particularly China and India and Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran, uh, Brazil. And so what you have shaping up, and this is the danger, is the United States seeking to expand NATO to the east and eventually break up Russia is being countered by Russia, backed up by a growing coalition of groups or countries around the world. And it's time for the United States to stand down. That's what will end this war. And that's why we need a peace movement. And that's why I'm speaking out. And we're convening actually a, a summit on Ukraine, uh, February 27th through the 3rd of March in partnership with Code Pink and a growing coalition of groups. Uh, there's a march uh, in Washington and various cities around the United States this uh, weekend on the 19th on Sunday. There's another uh, march and rally on the 23rd of March, uh, uh, which uh, Humanity Rising and uh, Ubiquity University are supporting. Uh, I'll be back there for that. Uh, but as we go through the news and we take on issues as we all do here at Humanity Rising. And today, um, dealing with the issue of race, we need to really always be present to the reality that there's an escalating war going on between the superpowers that is heading into a nuclear exchange. And we need to be aware of that and we need to demand that the war cease and that diplomacy uh, begins. Because if we don't, we're going to pay a price that is unimaginable uh, in our world. Let us just pause uh, taking this in. I encourage all of you to read Seymour Hirsch's uh, article. I'll put it in the chat uh, so you can all have access to it. Uh, it's uh, uh, his blog on Substack, uh, and um, uh, uh, it's important that we stay abreast of these kinds of developments. But let us breathe. That's what we do on Humanity Rising. We're all under stress. We're all under escalating stress. The news is crazy. People can no longer keep up. We had someone on uh, this show just about 10 days ago that they've identified a new syndrome headline syndrome. People are being traumatized just by the headlines in the news. And sometimes it's hard for me to bring these issues up because it's like looking at the, the sun in the eye with the naked eye. But that's our world. So when we breathe together, we're doing a form of breathing that has been shown scientifically to equalize your emotions, bring coherence to all of your body systems, particularly coherence between your heart and your brain. And when we do it together, studies show that we actually affect each other by coming into a harmonic that is empowering. So in a minute here, you'll hear the sound of a bell. For those of you who are new, when you hear the sound of the bell, just breathe in. 
slowly for about five and a half seconds. You'll hear another bell and breathe out for about five and a half seconds. We'll take about 10 breaths together and you'll feel much better. Thank you, everyone. Let us breathe together. Thank you, everyone. So good to breathe as one. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Joyce Hope Scott, who I've gotten to know over the last year or so. She's appeared first on Humanity Rising, and I was so struck by her brilliance and her encyclopedic memory of uh, chattel slavery that we invited her back in to do more. And she's now uh, uh, convened this three-day uh, program on Black women uh, voices around the issue of racism and apology and reparations. Uh, she's a clinical professor of African American and Black diaspora studies at Boston University. She's the co-founder and co-director of the International Network of Scholars and Activists for African Reparations and uh, carries a huge, big heart about these matters and it has assembled a, a group of, of women that have been profound and inspiring and uh, very, very compelling uh, this past several days. So uh, Joyce, I wanna thank you for everything that you've done and I turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Jim, and good morning to you, uh, all of us in the US, uh, West Coast, East Coast, and good day to those of you who are in other time zones of the world. Um, greetings to you. I uh, have to say happy Friday and the Lafayette to you uh, as a special day for me and many uh, who honor the ancestors and the divinities in our tradition. Uh, and I want to, as I always do, start out with honoring and thanking our ancestors those ancestors on whose shoulders we stand, all of our ancestors provided for us to be here today. Uh, and we are thankful and we cannot be uh, grateful enough to them uh, for laying the path for us, for, lay, lay, for us deciding to live, as I say, because some decided not to, but ours decided to, which is an extra, extra uh, note of gratitude that we owe them our apologies, our, our plea for forgiveness for our errors uh, and all the other things that we don't measure up to, but let us be careful and be thankful to embrace those wonderful things that they've left for us. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Ashe Ashe. I have with uh, me today two outstanding 
young ladies, um, both of whom I call my daughters, one who is actually my sister by blood and the other who is my daughter by spirit, adoption, everything else. And I'm delighted uh, to have them um, with us today because they are two brilliant fighters um, as young Black women. Um, and I want to introduce them to you. Uh, first, there is um, Barbara Elaine Hope, who is actually my sister, happily I, I say that, who is a graduate of Hunter College uh, in New York uh, with uh, advanced certificates in supervision, administration, school district administration, supervision, school building, leadership, and so on and so forth. She is a former uh, teacher. Uh, she holds a master's degree in science and elementary ed from Brooklyn College, also a bachelor's degree from uh, Empire University, uh, State University of New York, Empire State University and Metropolitan Center. And she's a licensed um, teacher in uh, K through sixth grade. Uh, I just want to point out to her and, and say to other teachers, I recognize that you, you are also uh, first responders. We, we don't see teachers as first responders. They indeed are because they prepare our firemen and our, our police officers who we do recognize, but I recognize them, teachers as first responders. Uh, she uh, was a lead teacher, former lead teacher at um, Brooklyn, PS 328, uh, modeling lessons and professional development, classroom management, all those wonderful things we need from wonderful teachers. Um, she also was a mentor um, at, the, at the, the public school where she uh, taught, where she provided support for new teachers, uh, classroom uh, planning and conferencing and modeling, management, data analysis, instructional strategies, um, professional goals development, uh, common core learning standards, all of those things that we need so much. Uh, she as well was a, a content specialist for New York State ELA math scoring, uh, member of the school consultation committee, uh, the school leadership uh, team, and a member of the school inquiry team uh, for her sections. Barbara says that um, her goal or her aim, and I've just cut down so many of the things that she's done. She was an out, outstanding teacher. Her goal was and is with children to nurture the mind and spirit of the child, to provide innovative and inspiration in my role as a change agent. And that's how she saw herself, sees herself, and to model what it means to be a change agent um, to you uh, and, and to the world that you wish to see. So Barbara, thank you uh, and welcome this morning. Thank you. My uh, next guest is um, Yvette Modesta Lipolata Aduke Apukisi Empress Modesta. And I'm saying all of those names and I hope I did not make a mistake. Um, Yvette is, is clear about claiming all of those names because all of those are ancestral links for her. Uh, she is a writer, an activist, a poet, abstract artist, and storyteller born and raised in, in Colón, Panama. Uh, she was named one of 30 Afro-Latinos, um, in, in the, one of the 30 Afro-Latinos whom you should know. She's the founder of and executive director of Encuentro Diaspora Afro in Boston, Massachusetts. She's been profiled in the Boston Globe as the community together for her activism in building a voice for the Afro-Latino community. She was named in Anfuentes in Panama for her advocacy in bringing attention to the struggle of the black communities in Panama, the focus on her home province of Cologne. Uh, WBUR uh, here uh, in Boston, the artery named Yvette as one of the 15 artists of color, the makers who are leaving their imprint on Massachusetts and elevating their artistry. She was the recipient of the first annual Dr. Martin Delaney Community Service Award in September of 2022. Uh, and she's received the Lifetime Achievement Award from El Mundo Boston newspaper, one of the oldest Latino newspapers in New England. She is also the diaspora coordinator of Red de Her Her de Herez, Afro-Latino Americanas, Afro-Caribbeanas de la Diaspora, 
an international network of Afro-descended women. She's released a book of poetry, um, chapbook As Ascenso de la Negura, Black ri Blackness Rising in May, 2022. And in the cover of, of the book, uh, she has one of her abstract paintings. I see some of them on the wall there, if you could see them in the back. She's co-founder of Rerooted, a space to celebrate Black artist culture. And she's the co-curator of the production Rerooted, as well as the founder of hashtag My Crown Speaks Street Stories. Thank you and welcome to both of you this morning uh, to one of another great program uh, put on by Humanity Rising. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for joining in. Let me just say that um, Black people, this is Black History Month. I want to remind us that we do have one month where we celebrate Black history, at least openly, and acknowledge it. And uh, Black people and women in particular have worked diligently over the decades to dismantle destructive historical myths and seek historical truths about African Americans and African descended people. In general, historical truths have help Black women develop emotional resilience amid threats to their identity and values. Now, some are advocating against what they call racial, uh, critical race theories and other kinds of truth telling about the socio-cultural, economic and political history of this country and all of its people. What do we think of that? How important is this historical knowledge, et cetera? I've been talking also as each day about people that have, women who've done extraordinary things that we've forgotten. Uh, and because they are among the ranks of our ancestral uh, archives, I want to note three more this morning, young women. Uh, and I'll just um, ask you to bear with me as I screen share, bring them up. Um, I guess it's going to do it. Oh, wrong thing. Sorry. Stop screen share for a minute. Uh, sorry. I have to get it. Let me just find it. Let me go. Okay, women, I was talking about change agents as, as Barbara said, she thought of herself as being and uh, certainly following in the footsteps of women who have, says a few of the black women who have been change agents fighting against the odds. One of the first of these mothers that we recognize, a great woman uh, is Ida Bell Wells, who was an American, American investigative journalist before there was such a thing. An educator, an early leader in the civil rights movement, she was one of the founders of the NAACP, which many of us may not even know because she got pushed to the side um, for male voices, which she didn't fight against. And we don't fight against the fact that they were important in, in this um, set establishment, but she should be recognized uh, for her contribution. She was born into slavery. And at the age of 14, took on the mantle that so many black women have had to take on uh, who've lost their mothers. Lose your mother, as uh, uh, Sadia Hartman has said. And she lost both of her parents and her brother uh, in the epidemic, the um, yellow fever epidemic of that uh, time period. And then she went to work. She disguised herself as a grown up, um, pretended to be 16 or 17, went out and got a job to take care of her siblings because she said, My parents would turn over in their graves if she knew that I allowed them to separate us. And she said, I cannot do it. So she disguised herself as a teacher and went uh, left with the family, went into Memphis. Uh, soon she was the co-owner of a newspaper, the Free Speech and the Headlight newspaper. Uh, and she started reporting uh, incidents on um, uh, that were happening, particularly focusing on lyn lynching. And she documented uh, in a pamphlet that she calls Southern Horrors lynch law in all its phases and the red record investigating frequent claims by whites that lynchings were done to black men because they were criminals and they wanted to rape or they did rape black women or white women. 
she exposed this uh, barbaric practice for what it was, simply an, an, an issue, of, an, an example of it, intimidation um, uh, to oppressed African-Americans who were in fact creating economic and political power. And they were posing a threat to whites and so on. She exposed that for what it meant. A white mob destroyed her newspaper. Uh, she had to slip out of town. Uh, under the cover of darkness, she left there, went to New, went to Chicago, New York. I'm, I'm leaving a lot out of her life. She went to the United Kingdom or to Britain and formed the first anti-lynching movement with women there, Scottish and British women, as many of you know who know her story. She's a woman to be remembered for her great struggle, not only in this area, but also in women's rights and the, and the women's rights to vote. She um, got a promiscuously uh, uh, honored a Pulitzer Prize special uh, citation for her outstanding courage. And after she's been on, the, on, on our stamp, as you know, she's on one of our, our um, post office stamps. After a century, after more than a century, you, you may know this, we just passed in 2022, the, anti, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act at the federal level, which was passed in March of 2022. Uh, and this is after decade, after more than a century of fighting. That is Ida B. Wells among those who fought for this. Another young woman, um, oh, sorry, if I can get her here. Um, Sadie Tana Moselle Alexander of Philadelphia, a native first person in the United States to earn a PhD in economics. Uh, she uh, went on to to school um, after uh, to, to to earn her law degree. Uh, she's the first woman to pass the Pennsylvania bar. Uh, she faced bitter, bitter discrimination, uh, acts of racial prejudice. She act, one of the deans actually campaigned, lobbied against her being selected to join the university's law review, but she persevered anyway uh, and made the the law review. Uh, she, in 1947, President Harry Truman named her to his Committee on Civil Rights. And while she's not remembered for that report, uh, that became the blueprint for the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Another woman who remains uh, muffled. 30 years later, President Jim, Jimmy Carter appointed her chair of the White House Conference on Aging, which also is very important today where we recognize that the discrimination against uh, or ageism and so on. And she is one of those persons who should be lauded for that. Another young woman who is uh, unlikely to succeed is Ursula Burns, who says, I'm here because I'm as good as you. Uh, and indeed she has shown that because uh, she was not supposed to succeed. Uh, she was a, a black and poor woman raised as a low income person in low income housing and a Manhattan uh, Lower East Side um, housing project. The second of three children, again, raised by the single mother trope, which we always uh, put, a, put out as a failure. This woman worked, um, she operated a daycare, a home daycare. She took in ironing, she took in cleaning so she could earn extra money to pay for Burns to attend a Roman Catholic prepar a preparatory school. So from her humble beginnings there and her mother's determination, here's an example of a, of a woman who defied the odds and stereotypes of coming up in a, a single family, a black home, a home of a poor black woman to be the first black woman named the CEO of a Fortune 500 company uh, where she became the chairperson and CEO of Xerox. You may know of her, and if you don't, give her praise and loud her achievements and all these other women who remained uh, unknown in the background uh, as we forget about them and move forward and honor others. Thank you so much. And um, I want to start out by uh, asking uh, my, my panelists, um, Again, what do you think, how important do you think uh, this historical knowledge is? We're calling for reparations and Yvette, you are working as I am in the front lines of reparation, restitution, atonement. I'm a, I want to ask you, in other words, um, 
this call for reparation, how important is it? How important was the knowledge to you, knowledge of self, to you in building the courage and persistence to fight for change, for justice and equality in your work? Both of you are fighters. You've you both been, I'll say, uh, for frontliners. Uh, as teachers are though, on the front line and poets also, and Toni Morrison pointed out, only the poet can write about slavery and other horrors of, of Black dispossession. I want to ask you to weigh in on that, Barbara, first, um, just your thoughts about the importance of knowledge, self making, uh, the idea that Black women have had to essentially self make uh, and uh, remind us what Kimberly Crenshaw says as the head of one of the um, statements for our workshop today. It's not about supplication. It's about power. It's not about asking. It's about demanding. It's not about convincing those who are currently in power. It's about changing the very face of power itself. I ask you to weigh in on some of that. Well, Black women are the backbone of the entire world and they always have been. They always have to fight, had to fight. They had to scratch, they had to, to stumble, get up, you know, push, carry the children on their backs. And they've always been in the forefront of all important things that have happened with black people around the world. So it's important that Black women and the, the, the contributions that they made are considered when we talk about reparations and when we talk about um, finding ways to atone and to heal what has been done to us. There, there's not, not enough amount of money that can pay for what has been done to us. So let's just forget about that. In the historical context, black women, black people have always been thought of as, as unimportant. They've always been beaten down, but we've always risen up, especially the woman, because she had to carry everything on her back and in her soul and in her spirit, she had to carry everything. So we can't talk about reparations and repair without looking at the contributions that Black women have made throughout history in this country and around the world. So what, what can we do? What is a good way of atoning for what has happened to the Black woman, especially these self-made Black women who pull themselves up from nothing and beat the odds who said, no, you're not gonna tell me what I can do or what I can't do because I am a strong black woman. I have the strength, the energy, the power of my ancestors within me and I can do whatever I want to do. I can do whatever needs to be done. And that is why we see these black women in history that have done unbelievable things, that have accomplished things that were said were unsurmountable and impossible for them to do, but they did it. And women today continue to do it. Black women continue to do it. They continue to reach heights that are un unthinkable. They become, as, as you said about the, um, the young lady before that became the CEO of Xerox, who would have thought, looking at her humble beginnings, that she could reach to such heights? But she knew in her heart, she remembered her mother working and sacrificing and, and giving her all so that she could go forward. Failure was not an option for her. Going that extra mile and doing the undoable is what she had in her heart and in her mind. And so did all the black women in history around the world. The ones who carried children on their backs and on their chests, and they went forward. They worked, 
they created homes, they took care of the families, and they did what they had to do in order to survive and to make it possible for their children to go forward, even in our own families, in our own family. We know that that is what happened. We know that our mother worked hard, un unimaginable hours of working just so that her children would have the opportunity to go places where she never had the opportunity to go. So I think historically, we need to know about black women and what they've done and their accomplishments. And we need to think about them, put them right here when we consider reparations and reparations that are fitting for these women who have sacrificed everything. What is fitting for these women? What would be correct? What would be enough? Even if a word, the word enough even fits in there. I don't even know that it does. Enough. It can never be enough to set it right, to fix it, to mend the broken, to lift up the downtrodden, to raise up the dead, to dry the blood. How do you do that? We think when we think of reparations, how do we do that? And we have to, as I said, always think of these black women because they are the lifeblood, the backbone of everything. When everything else stopped, black women kept moving. When there was no way, black women made a way out of no way. They've been doing it for centuries. They continue to do it today. We read about black women. We see where black women have made unbelievable contributions like the young lady that was instrumental in finding the vaccine for COVID-19. But we don't hear anything about her, but she exists. The women who worked at NASA to, to make, doing the math, creating the, the answers to the problems that no white men couldn't do, they did it. Yet they were relegated to certain spaces and places and couldn't go to the bathrooms that the white people went to, but they persevered and they survived. We are just now finding out about these women, about what they did. And there's so many others. That's just one example of what black women have done that has been covered up, that has been pushed under a rock, under the bed, forgotten. And now they don't want us to teach our history. They don't want their children to know what we've done, what we've accomplished through, through all of the trials and tribulations, what they have done to keep us from rising to the, stop, to the top, knock us down and still we rise. That is the history of the Black woman. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. Okay. Yvette, do you, please, would you help weigh in with this um, also from your experience? Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Good morning. Buenos dias. Alafia. Um, giving thanks to whose shoulders we stand on, lifting up the queens, the mothers, the guerreras, the warriors, uh, the sheroes. Uh, who have guided me, including the one that I'm spending time with this morning, my mom and Joyce. I, I wanted to, to start with a piece, a poem um, that I wrote uh, when we went into lockdown for COVID and soon after with the killing of George Floyd and then Breonna Taylor. Um, and as we talk about repair, it's not only, uh, and the, the poem is called, How Do We Emerge? What Will We Create? But the question becomes a question for us as a society, for us as a community, but also for us as individuals. Because um, the repair also has to do just as equally internally as it is for what we're asking for externally. Um, so to really uh, hope that these words resonate and then I'll just add a little bit after um, I'm done. 
uh, if folks want to close their eyes um, or just make sure, you know, sit in a way that you are fully present to the words. How will we emerge? What will we create? Expression. I will use my pen to paint a different picture. Can we emerge with love, genuine, unconditional love? Will we extend the hand without needing to receive, just give because the heart says so? How will we emerge? What will we create? Will it spark the revolution our soul reaches for? Will we use what we already have to keep winning on this journey we call life? Resiliency. How will we emerge? What will we create? I want to love the way I want to love, freeing my want to be, no judgment, just me rising in my birth-given light, loving Blackness, being Blackness, shining Blackness. How will we emerge? What will we create? Life is short. Will we stop playing the game? Say what you want to say. Do it with good intention. Will the negative language go away? Will we stop finding excuses that carry no moral gain? My pen will regain comfort in its fearless cry. My heart will slow down to feel the words. How will we merge? What will we create? What will the new normal in our community truly look like? Inclusion, more truth, more from the inside, less from what you show through materialistic eyes. Capitalism. Will we see each other? How will we emerge? How will, what will we create? Let us create healing, loving spaces that address conflict as growth. How will we emerge in this world with fear at a high pitch, racism on blast? What do you believe in? Can we find a common ground? This is a global, teachable moment. Authenticity. How will you show up? Will we be healthier spiritually and mentally? Will we move with heart? Will we listen to spirit? Our ancestors prepared us for this. Will we hold each other up? Will we begin to stand in our truth fearlessly? We already know why this is happening. The question now is, what will we do about it? How will we emerge? What will we create? How will we rise in these unpredictable times? What will we learn? My spirit needs movement. My skin needs the sun. How will we emerge? What will we create? Hopeful. Will we touch gently? I want to smell nature's natural scent. I want to walk barefoot on the grass. Grass. ¿Cómo vamos a amanecer? ¿Qué vamos a crear? Movimiento. Amor incondicional. ¿Dónde nos vamos a parar? Raza o cultura. Te veo, me ves. How will we emerge? What will we create? I will hug you tight. I will love hard and unapologetically. I will say it more. I love you. Te quiero. Will Babylon win? Standing in the light with the vibration of the ancestors, we will create a just society. We will rise up in our God-given light. We will emerge champions of our future. We will create everything that rhymes with love. Yeah, many questions. Now is our time to answer collectively. What is your answer? How will you emerge? I am emerging with you in heart and mind, creating a space for us to build a world that sees us together. Wow, thank you. I'm speechless. <laughs> it is hard to believe for a professor who's always got something to say. <laughs> so I, you know, I just wanted to start with that um, in thinking of what Black women do, what we are, who we are, how we show up. Um, we are the daily visual of what reparations is because we continue to rise up in the midst of the noise, um, in the midst of the wounded souls of you, as you share always, Mama Joyce, that as resilient as we are as black women and as black people, we are wounded. So to rise up requires 
an extra breathing moment, an extra pause. Um, and what reparations means, it will, it will mean an acknowledgement of that truth. And as uh, Mama Barbara was saying, that truth is not only not acknowledged in this country right now, it's, it's being erased. It's being erased. So we will have black girls coming out of schools in Florida and Texas who will not know about any woman you just spoke about because they are being seen as radical and uplifting and telling us, yeah, we are as good as you. Because what this is all about is telling us that we are not as good as you. And you are doing everything to make sure you take that away. So we need to do the extra. We need to say it to ourselves. We need to create spaces to uplift our truth because we are living in a space in a country, in a society, that the level of anti-Blackness, and I don't care whatever language you speak, because it shows up even when I speak in Espanol, that it is real. And the repair is of every Black person, wherever we are standing, whatever language that you colonized us with will require a repair that you cannot put a number next to because we hold it not only in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, and in our bodies. Because how many Black women are living high blood pressure, the high level of cancer, the high level of hysterectomies and fibroids, even if you take care of yourself, yeah. we are constantly in fight or flight. And we need ways to release that pain, that reality that we are not seeing in our human lives. And, you know, my poetry does that. And as you see in my paintings in the back of me, because it is real. We don't know what we are first. I don't I don't go through a day where at some point I'm not having to explain why I'm black and I speak Spanish and da 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 da. da. So we have some work to do. Um, but the most important work is to be able to know who you are, know your worth. And at times, boy, does that get challenged and questioned. But days like today, you show up. Um feeling right, feeling full. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, both Barbara and Yvette. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. And just um, listening to both of you, um, especially what you just finished on, uh, Yvette, I'm looking at um, something that Esohini Oriba, Orima um, wrote, she called Trapped in a Cage of Silence, and it's an ode, uh, apology. She says, dear Black women, some days I don't speak up because I'm worried about being the only one who sees the problem. Mm. And some days it's because I don't want to play into the stereotype of the angry Black woman. Some days... I'm too baffled by the fact that someone felt entitled to, enough to give me their unsolicited judgment on my ability to be their ideal child bearer. Some days it's because I'm tired. Mm -hmm. Most days, however, I don't speak because I've been socialized not to. These are the young girls you're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. I've been taught that everything from microaggressions to sexual assault should be tolerated endured and forgiven. Silence is not consent, it is the enemy. I tell students all the time when I want them to speak up in class, you know, silence is not golden. Although we love Nana, that was not, that we, it doesn't work here. Nana told us to be silent when, when, when grown people were talking and that was good, but silence is not golden, silence is not golden here. It's not consent, it's the enemy. <clears throat> 
it is a cage that keeps many women trapped in, in a world where equal rights and healthcare respect and are always out of reach, no matter how many milestones we reach, glass ceilings we shadow, or cages we break out of. As O'Neill Hurston probably said it best when she said, if you are silent about your pain, it'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. And that is the truth that women all over the world have to battle all the time. Uh, I know both of you, I know that you, uh, Yvette, um, are our sister from Panama and you've traversed the globe in many different places in Colombia and Venezuela, et cetera. Barbara, you as well have traveled often to West Africa. You have been involved in an NGO, Hope for Africa, which does programs that teaches um, people, raises uh, awareness about um, AIDS of young people. You've been involved in all of that as, as I have. So we have a lot of things in common. And when you when we talk about the the uh, earlier when we talked about the uh, the determination and making a way out of no way, uh, I just think of this image uh, that well it's not an image it's an experience that I had many years ago when I first went to uh, West Africa to to teach as a Fulbright professor I was out in a village well, I don't know doing something with somebody and and I I saw. Uh, a place that looked to me like a, it looked like a just a hole in the ground or something like a, a chasm of some type in the ground, and and they were saying, oh well, this is where we get our water from. I think we were talking about the possibility of trying to do a well there as an NGO. Yeah. And then in a few minutes, I looked and I saw a woman coming up. It was it was it was an incline. It was a steep incline. She was coming up from the bottom with a bucket of water on her head. And I, I was standing with my my mouth open and, and holding my breath because I knew, quote unquote, she would fall backward. And she came up, she got on a little bicycle and she rode off to her little cars in the village, making a way out of no way. Okay. Um, if we are silent, you know, she says, we will suffer most. So dear black woman, what would that be, that apology? What would it look like? Would it heal the soul of America, the world, making a way out of no way? Can you speak to that? Making a way out of no way, Barbara, and then Yvette. Yeah, I have a story. I would like to tell you a story of a little girl who came from a farm in a little town and how she made a way out of no way. The story of the black woman is never ending story. She rises, she falls, she stumbles, she crawls, ever moving towards the light, to the spirit, to the soul. Behold the black woman, fearless, and bold, on a horse, on her knees, on a trampoline, walking on water. Behold the black woman, see her, revere her, hear her song. Behold the black woman, 10 million elephants strong. See a little girl tethered to the land, to the woods, to the mud and dirt, who ran like lightning, like the wind on speed, free falling in her space on earth. Wild, wiry hair reaching for the heavens, too skinny for clothes to find something to hold on to. That was me. The farm was ours, my brother and I. Our oasis, our place, our refuge. And we did our best to rip the arms of our oasis right out of the sockets. To me, it was a beautiful life with family and love my mother's fried corn, daddy's sacks full of navel oranges, satsumas, tangerines, and pink grapefruits. Even so, in the midst of all of this, there lurked, there lurked a darkness, a shadow over my kingdom. I wasn't kind to Mother Earth's smallest and most vulnerable children, the tiny creatures, the helpless ones. I did terrible 
unspeakable things that haunt me in the night. Yes, I was a child, but I don't think the universe differentiates when it comes to apology, restitution, and atonement. It must be done, the young and the old. I see it as accumulating in your life bank. And at some point, you have to cash it in. How do I apologize, ask forgiveness, atone for my sins against Mother Earth? Apologize for being that little girl. Perhaps a million candles in the night, a vigil, a ceremony on my knees, arms reaching for the sky, calling out to the universe, the lost ones, to forgive a little girl who knew not the eternal ramifications of the foul things she had done. Ask the ancestors to intercede, would that be enough? Focus on the salvation of all living things to bring no harm to any creatures, no matter the size. I've been the one woman activist, policing the kitchen, making sure garbage is in the right receptacle to recycle, showing kindness to all creatures, big and small, donating to national and local animal rescue organizations, volunteering to help at animal shelters at every opportunity, teach the children, show them what it means to be a soldier for the salvation of the earth. At all costs, rescue, rehabilitate, protect the earth, its trees, the water, the air, the endangered species, the environment. Would that be enough? Would that suffice? Have I atoned in the eyes of Mother Earth? There's no such thing as a limitless supply of natural resources. Everything counts. The smallest negative action counts towards the demise of our planet. I am a transgressor against the divine only, the earth. I went to a small all black school that was the life, pride and joy of our rural black community. I read, used torn, used torn books, handed down to us when the white school got new ones. That's what they thought of us sitting in an old wooden desk with hidden sprinters, just waiting to ambush a hand or a butt. Black people sat in the balcony of the one theater in town. The future of young black women who remained in my town wasn't bright. As a matter of fact, it was downright bleak. Just a plethora of dreams that seemed impossible to fulfill. Our beloved school, I loved my friends and my teachers, my books, recess, the food in the lunchroom, even square dancing. I loved to read and follow my big brother anywhere he dragged me. All through school, life was good. I played basketball, softball, ran track, sang at, sang at assemblies, was the school queen twice in a row. Yes, all was well until one day it wasn't. The day the earth stood still. That day, I stood looking down at the sidewalk, my stomach churning, my heart racing as a man. A man was ransacking my life. My science teacher crushed my soul. He uttered those words, you can't stay in school any longer, Barbara. I was pregnant. That was the beginning of a soul's odyssey, a private hell a hurt like size eight shoes on a size 10 foot. The joy drained out of my life, my dreams, my plans, my secret aspirations crushed like a pebble under the tire of a cement mixer. I've never apologized to my body for betraying her, for going recklessly in the night, for forcing her to transform, to become a vessel while she was yet a child before it was time. For that, I apologize. How can I make restitution to my body? I can't take back the pain, undo the trauma, reverse the humiliation. I can just take care of her going forward and pray that she will stay with me, take me through, be strong, not leave me. I deserve your wrath. You're tired and the sparkle is fading from your eyes, but I am the you and you are the me. We are united against the world. 
Where will the journey lead us? The brother-in-law. Hmm. After the mistake, the brother-in-law became my judge, jury, and executioner. The one who seemed to shout, hang her to the guillotine with her, lop off her head. He actually did tell the family that they should banish her from the family. I'm grown now, and so is the daughter. We both made a liar out of him, big time. He never apologized, never spoke to me again. And I felt like a better woman because of it. Marriage much too young with babies in the mix, where to go? Where to go? What to do? How to get out? Low self-esteem, no love, just sadness. Days and days of stifling sadness. Tangled up and constricted, I fought to get out and found a way. If it would work, if I could pull it off, I decided that if there was anywhere on this planet that I could go to college, I would find it. I kicked my husband squarely to the curb, asked my parents if they would help me with my children, applied to Spelman, was accepted to my great surprise, and dashed off to see if I had anything left in me that I could use to change my life. What would an apology from him look like? Maybe a brand new Mercedes to replace the new car that he took from me and gave to his pregnant girlfriend. That might do. There were times during my quest for an education that I left the children with my parents. They never said no. They never stopped loving me. And most of all, the children were content to be on the farm. How do I apologize to my parents and the children? An ancestral ritual, a tribute to them, a round table so they can tell me how they felt in those hours when they needed me and I wasn't there, scream in my face, a chance to let the pain ooze out like an erupting boil, burn candles, pour water, call out to Mama Chamba, a shame, a shame, a shame. New York, how on earth did I wind up there? chasing dreams, wide-eyed and full of expectations. Did you know that there are racists in New York City? A white male supervisor refused to give me a promotion. He preferred to promote his own kind. Once on the train, as I was getting off at my stop, a white guy stood in my way. He looked at me with stabbing hate in his eyes. My heart raced. I felt really scared, wondering if he was going to lash out at me maybe pull out a knife. I had never experienced anything like it. His eyes followed me down the platform until his train pulled out of the station. Why are racists racist? Children don't see color, they just see people. Racists are taught to be racist, to hate, to hurt. How do you change the heart of a racist? Get your behind back in school, my sister said. I didn't have a spare penny. Still, there was that thing driving me onward. I thought of my parents, my dad, who always preached to us about the importance of an education. Those words resonated in my head day and night. Figure it out, figure it out. Daddy was sitting on my shoulder, glaring at me. Gal, you know you've always been smart. All my children are smart. You better get your education because I didn't have a chance to get mine. You don't have a choice. Five years and two master's degrees later, I was teaching in East New York. The children of East New York, children of a lesser God. Did that make them any less entitled to all the trappings of a good education, like the children that went to St. Anne's in the good neighborhood? It was a very poor section of Brooklyn, overlooked, underserved, crime on every corner. There are so many reasons for the children to fail most of them intertwined with the failing system of a corrupt city, the healthcare system, lack of social programs, schools that were mass holding cells. It's the duty of a society to nurture the children, provide intervention strategies, safety, a chance to make good on their lives. Teachers are first responders too. Did you know that? <laughs> Black women, the stories of lives put on hold, lives with children on their backs, traveling roads with no map and no GPS. 
the backbone of the universe. My mother's story, a black woman working without words, early morning treks to a factory to stand all day and into the early mornings of the next day in freezing cold or searing heat. She had six children to care for and ready for school. The story of desperate women and white men who took them and used them, underpaid them, working in unsafe, cold places on their feet, never resting. What does restitution look like? Perhaps a space where female descendants of these women could gather with their daughters to vent, to talk about those women and heal? How about some good, safe, well-paying jobs? A sister's story of abuse, torment, and total domination. A woman determined that the story he wrote was not to be the final story of her life. A sister who succeeded against all odds, went to school, got a degree, and ultimately became the chair of the history department where she taught. So many stories of Black women, giants, undeterred though blocked, mocked, cheated, castigated, degraded, sold, dragged, kit, kicked, mutilated, children torn from their bosoms. But still she rises in grace. She is the infinite eighth wonder of the world and she is my joy and salvation. That is my story or most of it. I hope that I made my father proud. I hope that I made my sister proud. And I hope to hell I showed my brother-in-law that he was a liar, that nothing could stop me, that I was a black woman and nothing could keep me down. Didn't he know? Didn't he know his history? He professed to all the black women across the world who stood up, rose up, sat up, in the middle of the night, wondering how they would feed the children. That's what we do. That's the story of the Black mama. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Yvette. That, yeah, I'm... Thank you. You know, I wear my heart on my sleeve. That really, you know, you, the question was, how do we get out of, you know, no way? Um, I think we are brought into this world knowing that uh, we have to do an extra. We have to we're constantly having to um, create new versions of ourselves. Uh, you know, I think of myself as that child in Panama in this segregated, um, in this beautiful province of Colón, just full of blackness. And then in this midst of this Pride is this sort of territory that creates joy and confusion and it's segregated and it's racist and I'm challenged to constantly rise up. You know, I think one of the things that connects me to Mama Joyce and now to Mama Barbara is, yes, you know, in that mist you succeed because I also was a cheerleader was the prom queen, you know, and, and it's not about, you know, when I look back at those moments, it's like, because we were, I was already being prepared to rise up um, in settings that wouldn't see me. Um, and I was given, I was already in practice <laughs> since I was a child. And then as an athlete, um, uh, when I think about bodies, um, I was a college uh, athlete, which a lot of people don't know. I was a national runner for Panama since the age of eight um, and ran for Panama, ran for my, my province. And then um, 
continued to run for many years, but also played all kinds of sports, but played tennis in college. And it was some of the most um, racist moment when I came to this country where you come from being this black space that honors you are talented, you make this team and everything about you being on this team is questioned because you're the only black person on the team. So I had that experience in high school and then to come to have the experience in college, but it wasn't just about my talent, it was my body. You know, I always laugh and I have a poem in my new book about black women's bodies um, because instead of being seen as a good athlete, it was my body. You know, I, I laugh with friends and I say, I was Serena before Serena. And so when I watched Serena, I understood, you know, um, because I wasn't, I wasn't a runner. So I wasn't shaped in this very small frame or whatever. And so I was constantly being challenged. And one of my matches, I was winning the match. And the coach from the other team, this was my freshman year, stopped the match because I was winning and he thought I was cheating. And I had a white coach who clearly did not know how to navigate this very racist moment um, of not my talent as a tennis player being questioned, but my talent as a black tennis player uh, being questioned. And he didn't say anything to me. I saw them speaking and all of a sudden I was told that we were going to have a line judge um, because the other coach was questioning my calls. And it was such a, you know, moment of, oh, wow, you know, I'm having to prove myself in the game, but I'm also having to prove myself as an honest human being, as a, you know, standing on principles, standing on all of this, and having to get through the match while I'm dealing with the noise that was happening around me. And, and I think that is Black women. We are always having to stay present in what we're doing while the noise around us is extremely loud um, and what that means. And, you know, I think we need to continue to, to speak on that um, and what that means. So when I think of our way out and we're talking about repair and reparations is we don't have we don't know any other way but to, as Mama Barbara shared in her story, to keep going. You know, in the last two years, my father transitioned and I've had two major surgeries. Um, then I know that if I didn't have the tools to navigate and ask the right questions and demand to, to be dealt with in, in a human, respectful way, it wouldn't have happened. And it made me come closer to understanding what we're faced with in the system that does not see us. Even if we're educated and you have all the education and you show up right, you speak the right words, you say the right things, but all they see is Black and then you always have to navigate to push through that negativity that they hold to blackness to get what is right for you, for the people that you love and care about. And at the end of the day, love, we black women, black community, our repair is that we need to love ourselves extra love those who stand before us extra and understand that we are surviving, we are resilient and we are rising uh, because the world was not set up for us to, to continue to do that. 
So every day we get up and we rise up and we challenge anything that's faced before us as Black women, as Black people, is a day that says, Ashe, this is who I'm standing on and I don't show up alone. Thank you so much, both of my sisters. I know that I'm going to give some time to Jim uh, to come in and ask or say uh, comment comment as the case might be. Uh, just in just closing out for us this time and thank all of you for participating. Uh, an ode to black women. This is a poem, Brina Jeffries, I think is appropriate for this moment. The blood that runs through my veins runs through yours. Not literally, but rather in a metaphysical, systematical, psychological kind of way. We go through things, you know, we feel great pain, having the burden of not only ourselves, but of the anguish that comes from being the protectors of our culture, our men, our children, our society. They ask, why are we so angry? They tell us to smile a little more, have a kinder tone, straighten your hair, cover your black skin, not to be so damn proud, lighten up a little bit, not knowing that without the weight of the world on our shoulders, we're kindred loving spirits whose reputation is being narrated by men. Thank you. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Thank you, Jim. Please, we'll give you some time to speak. Wow. What uh, powerful stories, uh, <clears throat> Yvette and uh, Barbara. Um, I've left a little speechless, I must say. Uh, and just want to acknowledge uh, your heroism in a very deep and profound way. And, you know, the poem that you just wrote, I read, uh, Joyce, you know, when you're carrying such deep emotion and people tell you, just smile, <laughs> you know, what, you got a problem today? I mean, it's such, it blows one's mind. Uh, and what I wanted to, it was just coming up for me now as uh, I've been watching a, a docu-series on Netflix called African Queens. And I don't know whether you know that, but it's uh, the story of uh, a queen in, in Jinga uh, in Angola uh, back in uh, the early 17th century as the Portuguese had established the base on the African coast right there because it was the shortest distance to Brazil across the Atlantic. <clears throat> and they had a quota of, I think, 15,000 slaves that they had to fulfill uh, every couple of months. And it just is the story of how the African indigenous populations responded to that level of coercive force coming into Africa with a technical superiority and weaponry that was uh, uh, overwhelming. And this young woman, uh, rose to power uh, because of her clarity and courage and strategic capacities. And um, uh, so as you were talking, uh, that uh, that story came to mind that I would recommend uh, all of us uh, watch. It's called African Queens uh, on, uh, on Netflix. Uh, so, um, and then I also wanted to bring in uh, Joy, something you said in the green room, and I, I I was a little taken by it, but I wanted to explore it further, because every day we uh, uh, do our breathing, our coherence breathing, and Joyce uh, made the comment that for some people, they haven't been able to breathe for 500 years, and I think that's worth just touching on, that, that you know, when we do something that seems so normal at one level and therapeutic at another level. Um, we need to bear in mind that for some people, as George Floyd said, dying, I can't breathe. 
I'm not allowed to breathe. And I haven't breathed for a very, very, very long time. And so I would just like to raise that and see what you all would comment on that uh, as we continue our dialogue. Yes. Um, thank you, Jim, for bringing that up. That that series is inspired by my colleague uh, from uh, Boston University. Uh, oh, really? And outstanding. She's the uh, the master or mistress, if you will, of Queen Zinga and uh, that whole story. And I'm so pleased that uh, they had the good sense to be inspired uh, by it's Very her. well done. Uh, very absolutely, well. absolutely. Um, another young woman, Queen Zinga and her sister also, they were warriors. When I think I'm, I don't know if I've said, I say to my students all the time, listen, we have to change the language and we'll go into that. We've done that in reparations sessions, uh, Yvette, as you know, one of the first things we changed was the way we talk about the Africans that were brought over here. These people were not slaves. They were like you and me, they were sitting, you know, they were in their temples, they were in their fields. They were warriors, most of them. Most of them were warriors uh, fighting uh, as in Zinga to keep uh, their the sanctity of their communities. So mm. that's why they were ready for war. This is why they had to be stuffed into the hole of the ships naked and chained because they were warriors. And because if they had a moment to breathe as Sinke had, you'd find a way to get out and, uh, and bring down the ship. There are so many stories of people trying to breathe who brought down ships, so many ships under, uh, under the off the shores of Cabo Verde and uh, South America and so on that we don't talk about another piece of history carefully hidden. Every ship didn't make it, although millions and millions and millions of people came over, uh, uh, double that number died and uh, and many, many thousands of, of ships went down where they brought them down because we'll bring them down and we will it will kill everybody. Uh, that's, that is the extent to which they were. So to, to wonder where of this determination to keep going and you can't do anything but keep going, even if there's no GPS and there's no map on your road, that, that goes without saying, people, the, these people were fighters. They came here fighting. The trope of, um, of not being able to breathe is, is that, that George Floyd, it was so powerful to me as I watched it. It was one of the most grueling things that I ever watched. And it's not that I haven't seen things like that before, uh, murders and so on. I teach, this is what I teach, the story of, of African, uh, of, of America and the African story within it. But but it brought to me the idea that this is this is an old story here that this thing that's happening now is a five hundred year old story because it's exactly the language that people spoke the the people uh, the Wolof the uh, the the Fon, the 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 Manding uh, Yoruba whoever they were there were saying I can't breathe in the hold of the ship or on the slave plantations of Brazil in the heat of the day when the, the, the cane has cut their arms and the, the, the perspiration was, was uh, burning them, I, you know, it's, I can't read, it's such a trope, you know? So reparations would be giving people space to breathe. It's what our ancestors asked for right after the Civil War. He said, all we want is land. The 40 acres, remember, that they didn't get? All we need is land, a space to go, they said, and heal ourselves. That's all they wanted to breathe. That's all they, and, uh, Africans have ever wanted is to be able to breathe. Mm -hmm. So and that that is the first thing that has to happen with the healing, the re restorative justice, re the repair. Give people, move out of their way and give them the right to breathe. Mm -hmm. Their forests, stop cutting them down. That's how they, how we get the air to breathe. And in our breathing, everybody breathes. Thanks for bringing that up. I think that's so important. I don't know if other people have a comment. Yvette, to say to Barbara, any comment? Barbara and uh, Yvette? Yeah, I was listening to my esteemed sister and uh, how she was talking about how the slaves took the slave ships down. And when you think of death, you think of no more breathing. But this was the moment when they did breathe, when they were released from the hell mm. that they were in. 
that is when all the breath went out of them. There was no more breathing. It was just existing like sardines in a can. So they did what they had to do in order to breathe that life back into them, which was death. Take the ship down, then we can breathe <clears throat> because we're not, we're mm -hmm. not going to live in this indignity, in this horror. They don't see us as human beings. They don't think of us as people with hearts and lungs and, 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 and feelings and desires. Even though when they took us from our land, we were, we were living, we were breathing then. We were breathing. And so as we were chained and drugged and stuffed, we thought we can't breathe again. We'll never breathe again because we will never see our homeland again. We will never see our families, our children, our mothers, our fathers, the corn, the rice, the peanuts. We'll never see those things again. We'll never grow those things <clears throat> in our land. And so my father always thought that if you had land, you had something worth more than gold. He always told us, you can't have, you can't be rich if you don't have any land. You have to have land. And I was young. I didn't think about it. Then I was like, well, what do I need land for? All I need is money. <laughs> but as I got older, I understood. As I learned, as I went to school, as I engaged in conversation with others, as I traveled, as I began to see the world and how other cultures exist, and how people show kindness to each other and how they revered the land, how they treated the land, how they, they didn't scrape the skin from Mother Earth, how they didn't chase their children and kill them and kill them until there were no more. That's what these people did they didn't think about the earth mm. and what they were doing to it. The, 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 the spiraling, the domino effect of taking, 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 and never giving back. And now look at us, look at the predicament that we're in mm. with the climate change and with the earth, with, with, with the glaciers melting. The poor polar bears won't have a home. The animals that live in these places won't be able to find food. They won't be able to breathe. And it is the same with us. Right now, we're saying, you know, if you consider what you've done and you think about how to plead for forgiveness, and find a way, listen to us tell you how to apologize. Don't you tell us. Listen to us tell you how you need to apologize. Because you can't tell me. You are the perpetrator. How can you tell me how to apologize? Because you're just going to do what you do to look out for you. But we're going to tell you what you need to do to apologize, to atone, to heal us. Because right now we're bleeding, mm -hmm. we're hemorrhaging and we haven't stopped in 500 years. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna tell you what you need to do and you are going to listen so that we can breathe again. Mm. Father, you oh. bet. <laughs> oh, I, I, I guess I wanna put it in another way because we are breathing, we, you know, we, we get up and yes, we haven't been able to breathe in 500 years, but I also want to extend to another word. We haven't been able to exhale. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, We can breathe, but, you know, my mentor, Charles Turner, may he rest in light and peace. I remember when he was unjustly framed and was about to serve time and we met for dinner before he was going away. And he said to me, I hope you come to a place where you are able to exhale. Um, and in, in, in community and in my personal life. And I think when I think of that, it's like we breathe, but how often do we just get to go <sighs> and really let go and not have to look over our shoulder or worry about what's about to happen in that exchange and worry about how we are seen as not beautiful. I have to worry about, you know, my hair, you know, because there's still places where I can't wear my hair like this. Like, do we get to, we, we're breathing, but do we get to exhale? Mm -hmm. And that, and that means your everyday black woman. And, and, and what we saw, what we've learned is through Michelle Obama's experience uh, through any Black woman that raises to a certain level, we are not ever able to truly exhale in our comfort. So I just wanted to read something very short um, that's one of the small ones, and I'll close out this way, and it's called Natural Beauty, Misty, Serena, and Jill. Our body is not shaped like our, yours. We have made peace with that reality, embraced it, and celebrated it. When we see that and understand its own beauty and beyond, then you will see the beauty in Mr. Copeland's thighs, Serena Williams' arms, Jill Scott's curviness. Beyond our bodies lies blessed talent, hard work, and yes, natural beauty. Beyond your criticism, Misty's sculptured thighs are deeply rooted in African soil that extended beyond the dance floor. Serena's arms serve history and resiliency. Jill's soulful vibration lifts our spirit, announcing we are here. Yes, our body is not shaped like yours. That is why it is our body. Black, beautiful, blessed, the way we all are. So to me, it's, we are breathing, but can we now 500 years in be ever able to exhale? Mm. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I never thought that thought before. That's, that's very profound. Because breathing is one thing and being able to just ah, mm -hmm. is a whole other level of breathing. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, um, Joyce, we should just close out on that beautiful note. And why don't you give us a blessing from your tradition as we close? I know this is a special day. And uh, so anything you want to say as a benediction for us as we conclude this three-day program, uh, that would be a wonderful thing. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Chuba, uh, Chuba, Chuba, honored ancestors, divine Mama Chamba, Chu Salu, Chu Remercy, Chu Demand Pardon. Nyanisoyan Alo Amyon Ondo Honiche, Honored Ancestors, Alger Slim Hope Senior, Julia Clara Mays, and all the known and unknown. And you could say the name of your ancestors, just the names, just the last names of your ancestors, if you would say it. Sansobli, Lijmo, Kabli Kabli, Mubido, Poa, get away of Zambinon, Mima, Aho, Kubili, Kabli Kabli, Mubido, Poa, get away of Zambinon, the label Kushi, the Sule, always is a po, where you hope, they got the point, Cardinal. Omelon Ayo Goswin Lay, the Karifu Omelon Yu Clan Lay Po. Who all be blessed. I invoke blessings in English. Hopefully, some of you understood the other languages I spoke, but I give thanks and ask for peace and healing and health and success and well being 
and honor and respect and dignity, righteousness in the sense of rightness for all of us, blessings for the children, for the children who are here, the children who are gone. Ask for divine guidance. We give honor and respect and dignity to all our ancestors and our divinities, to the divine force, the divine Ashe that created us all. May we embrace each other in Ashe, in honor and respect, because we are all a part of one. Onali, the earth, give us your pardon. Help us to learn how to say we're sorry and to do the rituals of atonement that we need. I open blessings. I invite, invoke, and give and embrace the blessings of the divine creators, the divines, divinities, and our ancestors. May you have peace, may you have blessedness. Ashe, 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 O. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Mm, Ashe. Thank you, everyone. That brings our three day program to a close. Thank you all. Blessings. Ashe. Bye. Thank you, Ashe.